Thank you, Craig. Now, for those of you who joined us last week, we started a brand new series called The Great Comeback. And the premise behind the series is that it's no surprise that you and I have been through some waves and some storms and some deep currents threatening to take us down over the last 18 to 24 months. And the whole idea is, how do we have resilience to bounce back? How do we have resilience to come back? And by definition, we need to grow within us that which is greater than outside of us. We need to grow and nurture values and qualities and powers within us that will outlast all storms and all waves and all currents. And so one of the things that we know for absolute certain that will give us that kind of resilience comes from a verse which you've probably heard at many weddings. And every time we think about love, it is a verse that can even fall into cliche and thereby at times lose its power. But Paul is writing to a church similar to ours and he says, but these three remain faith, hope, and love. When he says remain, he's looking into the distant future after Christ returns. He's looking into the new creation. And so these things that remained, faith, hope, and love, outlast all evil, all storms, and all challenges. And therefore, if you and I are to have resilience within us, last week we spoke about can we therefore grow a resilient comeback faith? And today we're going to be talking about a comeback hope. And wouldn't you agree with me that hope is something we so desperately need right now? And if ever there are a group of people on planet earth, it is the people of God to demonstrate a comeback and a resilient hope. So on a scale of one to 10, I'm not gonna ask you to stick fingers in the air or to write anything down. Just in your mind's eye, on a scale of one to 10, where is your hope needle? Now, for some of you, things are already starting to turn around. Maybe you've been able to celebrate a few things. I know we've had some births, we've had some marriages. And so maybe your hope needle is on the top half, six, seven, eight, nine out of 10. But for some of you, the hope needle is in the one or the two or the three. And we'll talk about that in a second. But even if you are on the lower end of the hope scale, I want to ask you, what are you hoping for this year? So as you think about that, let me tell you what I'm hoping for this year. If I'm honest with you right now, I am honestly, and it's, this is not the gospel according to anything or anyone, this is just me and I may be wrong, but I am feeling optimistic concerning the whole COVID situation and everything that we've been through. I am hoping that we've been through the worst. And therefore, the second thing I'm hoping for is that you guys will be able to find solid ground beneath your feet again. And you will be able to rebuild that which was lost and taken away. I'm also hoping for our economy to improve. I'm also hoping that we as a church, as we've had so much stripped away and we've had to put down deeper roots, I am hoping to see such kingdom fruit in and through our lives this year. I'm also hoping, and I hope I get an amen for this, I'm hoping to do some great fishing this year. (laughs) I'm hoping for my family's health. And maybe some amends for this one, but I'm really hoping that this is the year that we get to take our next step forward as our church concerning our land and our property. Amen. Amen. Now, all of these are good things. And all of these are things that I have prayed for, for me, my family, for you, for our nation, and I will continue to pray for. 
But maybe the reason why some of you on your hope scale are not hitting a seven, eight, and nine, but you're hitting a one, two, and three is because there were things that you hoped for and your hopes were dashed. And then you risked to hope again. And then those hopes were dashed. And then maybe things look good for another season. And so one more time, you mustered up all the hope within you. And then something dashed those hopes as well. And now you're hearing me talk about hope and you want to hope, but you're afraid to hope because you're afraid of disappointment and knowing what some of you have been through. I get that. But the way the Bible describes us is that we ought to be a people of hope. And we're going to unpack that. If you're not feeling very hopeful, I hope that isn't condemning. I hope by the end of today's message is going to be a direction we can trust God to lead us into. But we ought to be a people of hope. Earlier I read from 1 Corinthians 13 to 13, a verse just before that, verse 7 says, love always hopes. It always hopes. Here's another verse. Remember last week, looking at 1 Corinthians 13, 13, we're looking at this trifecta of faith, hope, and love. We want to talk about a resilient comeback faith, a resilient comeback hope, and a resilient comeback love. And while this verse is maybe the more obvious verse that talks about faith, hope, and love, there are many others, if you have eyes to see in the New Testament. Here's another one, 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 8. But since we belong to the day, Let us be sober, putting on, this is a choice. This is from last week, putting on faith, putting on love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. Once again, this verse showing the primacy of faith, hope, and love. That faith, hope, and love is our first defense against fear. It's our first defense against the enemy. And it's the first thing that should be true of us and that people should should see is ultimately true of us. So when we think about some of the things we hoped in and maybe our hopes were dashed, I want to talk about this in terms of small h hope versus capital H hope. Here's one definition of hope, and this is the one that I'm going to use for today. And it is this, it is desire accompanied by expectation. So according to this definition, it's probably not perfect, but I think it's helpful. There are two main elements here. Desire, that's the degree to which my heart and my emotions are invested in this. That's why hope is an emotion in a sense. But it's also accompanied by expectation. So let's think about desire and expectation in terms of hope. You see, sometimes, and this is okay, but sometimes we have high levels of desire, but admittedly low levels of expectation. And that's part of life. Let me give you a very silly practical example from December. You would know we haven't had a summer. Why? Because, man, I was worried that Noah's Ark was going to come out because it's been raining so much. And so we got to a couple of days before Christmas and I realized I haven't had a bri for weeks. And all I wanted to do was have a bri. So I had a high level of desire. I was like, I hope that tonight I can have a bri. Yet I look outside I look at the app and I've got low levels of expectation that I'm going to have a bride. Now that's okay, it's a silly example. But what the Bible warns us about is while it's fine to have small age hope in those kinds of things, we need to be careful about putting capital H hope in those kinds of things. Let me give you some examples. Psalm 118 verses 8. But the psalmist writes, it is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust or to hope in man. Now this verse isn't saying don't trust people. This verse isn't saying have some level of small age hope 
in people in your family, in your boss, in your kids, in people who have power over you or in our nation. It's not saying that. In fact, the scriptures say, 1 Corinthians 13, that love always hopes and love always trusts. But the difference is, I am not to place capital H hope. I'm not to place ultimate hope in people because even the best of them will let us down. And you know what the evidence of that is? You have let yourself down more than anyone else. And so let's hope in people with a small H. But let's put our capital H hope in God. Here's another example. 1 Timothy 6 verses 17. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to what? Put their hope. Now, grammatically, this is not there, but just the way this is used, this is the capital H hope I'm talking about, not to put their capital H hope in wealth. Why? Because it's so uncertain. Rather, to put their hope in God. Once again, this verse isn't saying, do not be wealthy. This verse isn't saying if you are wealthy and you're hoping to have a wonderful holiday or you're hoping to enjoy your new car, whatever the case might be, it's not saying that as long as that kind of hope is a small age hope. Because even our wealth, and if anything, the last two years has shown this to us, 2008 showed this to us, is so uncertain. So let's rather put our capital H hope, our ultimate hope in God. And so I think the mistake we make so often is that we place capital H hope in things we ought to place small H hope on. And then when small H hope things let us down, we lose capital H hope. You with me? Right from some of the smaller things. I mean, hoping for your team to win. I've seen people whose lives are shattered when the wrong person wins the Grand Prix. <laughs> Not looking at you, Conrad. <laughs> to maybe some bigger things. When we're really hoping that this job interview is going to change my future to even bigger things where we're really hoping for this miracle or this healing in my life or the life of someone around me. But then when those things don't go the way we want them to, not only do we lose capital H hope, which is so understandable, we give up on all capital H hope. And so here's where I'm hoping we can grow and mature and nurture a different kind of comeback, resilience, hope. Now, this may seem impossible to you. But according to the way hope is described in the Scriptures, it is possible to lose all small age hope and yet still maintain a buoyant resilience life-giving, beautiful, powerful, capital H hope. It is possible to be let down by friends and to lose hope in relationships. It is possible to be betrayed at work or by someone you trust. It is possible to lose all financial security. It is possible to not get that job. It is possible to not get that miracle. Once again, all good things worth hoping for, worth praying for, but it is possible to lose all those things and yet still have a buoyant confidence and desire and expectation connected to who God is. What He is in fact doing even in our difficulty and what He has planned for us. Let me show you with a couple of verses that just illustrate this for us. Romans 5 verses 2 to 5 says this, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. But not only so, because we could stop there, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. What? <laughs> that doesn't make sense. 
Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Notice the domino effect here. Perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out His love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom He has given us. This verse or these verses go against everything that is in our default setting. We may want to, uh, uh, in fact, we may expect life to be in the following way. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Yes, Lord, amen. But not only so, we despise our sufferings. And instead of allowing suffering to produce faith and perseverance, I give up. And instead of allowing perseverance to strengthen my character, I become angry and bitter. And as a consequence, I never get to experience the kind of resilient hope that God wants to pour into my heart via the love of His Holy Spirit. Here's another verse. Romans 12, verses 12. Imagine it's only four words long. Be joyful in hope. Praise the Lord. Amen. And patience in affliction. What? How can I have hope and affliction? And then one more thing, be faithful in prayer. So how is this kind of capital H hope possible where I'm experiencing affliction, where I'm experiencing suffering and loss and somehow there is a hope with such deep roots within me that it always brings me back. Well, as we spoke about faith last week, the same is true of our hope. It all comes down to what we place our hope in. Let's go back to our definition of hope, a desire accompanied by expectation. And so the idea is the more expectation we have, in other words, the more confidence I have that what I'm hoping for is going to come true, the more I can invest my desires in that thing. And so ultimate biblical hope is less about placing small edge hope in temporary things, even good, even godly temporary things, but rather certain things absolute things, ultimate things, because then I have 100% expectation, 100% confidence, and therefore I can place incredible amounts of desire in that place. Whenever Craig and I reference a verse from 1 Peter, we always try and remind you that Peter was writing into a very difficult situation. The church that he was writing to was being physically and violently persecuted. Not because they had to wear a mask. Not because someone dissed them on social. Their lives were being taken from them. These were people who had lost children and brothers and sisters and parents. These were people who had lost all social dignity, who had lost possessions, churches. And yet Peter writes to them and right from the outset, this is what he says, praise to be, sorry, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never circle, underline, highlight that word never, that can never perish, spoil, or fade. If ever you're looking for somewhere where you can place your hope that is gonna outlast all storms of life, it is in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the inheritance that He has won for us because it is an inheritance that will never 
never, never perish, spoil, or fade. And that kind of hope, no one and nothing can take away from you. According to these verses, our hope, our capital H hope is not in our best life now. It's not in being comfortable. It's not in everything going our way. It's not in our politics or our economy or getting the right guy or girl. Again, all good things. It is in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and what that means and what he has won on our behalf. And that is the foundation of biblical hope. Timothy Keller sums this up like this. He says, Christianity does not agree with the optimistic thinkers who say, we can fix things if we try hard enough. Nor does it agree with the pessimists who see only a dystopian future. The message of Christianity is instead, things are really this bad. And we can't heal or save ourselves. Things are really this dark. Nevertheless, there is hope. And that's what we need for 2022. So let's get practical. How can we grow in this kind of capital H hope? Well, firstly, it's a matter of focus. I'm going to ask you to do something weird. I'm going to ask you to take your finger and just about a foot in front of your face here. Not so that you can tell me off, all right? And just carry on looking at me. I am in focus, whereas you're probably seeing two or three fingers. Now change your focus. And now your finger is in focus, but I'm out of focus. You can put your finger down. I haven't gone anywhere. The stage in the hall hasn't gone anywhere. It is still there. But at that point, it is not the focus of your vision. And in the same way, we need to focus our attention on the ultimate things. And by focusing our attention on the resurrection of Jesus Christ and all that that means and the eternal life He gives us and the inheritance He has won for us, it doesn't mean the waves go away. It doesn't mean the storm goes away. It doesn't mean the economic and the political situation goes away. It just means it's not the center of your focus. So we need to learn to focus on the ultimate point of our hope. Number two, it is also a matter of reprioritizing. Here's, I believe, a challenge for many of us. When I talk about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ in terms of desire and expectation, for many of us, your expectation is 10 out of 10. You're like, yep, that's who Jesus is. That's what he has done. That was what he has won for me. And I'm confident that whether he returns in my lifetime or later, he will make all things new. He will take death and suffering and pain away. And we are gonna spend eternity into a, in a cosmic Eden. And while your expectation is high, your desires are low, your heart is not moved. And I think what is being highlighted there is we have possibly placed capital H hope and desires and affections on things that are only worthy of our small H hope. You see, our desires will follow our priorities. Let me prove it to you. If you had to go home today and take every cent of your life savings and invest in crypto, I'm not saying that's what you must do. Don't say Stephen said. I'm just going if, okay? This morning you woke up not caring at all about crypto. Tomorrow morning, you're going to wake up, wake up deeply caring about crypto. And you're going to be watching those trends every five minutes. Why? Because you have prioritized, you have invested. And in, even, in, even if you didn't have a desire and in investments, now your heart 
follows. And in the same way, as we change our focus, as we reprioritize on the things of God, certain things, ultimate things, as we choose to invest our heart and our times and our talents and our passions in the things of God and His kingdom, our hearts will follow so we can have certainty, high levels of expectation and high levels of desire, aka capital H, hope. Number three, it's a matter of asking. I'm hoping you're starting to, I'm hoping, yeah. I'm hoping you're starting to realize this is the kind of hope you need. But the scriptures say we do not have because we do not ask. The time did come when I was able to have my December briar. Problem was the wood was a little bit wet. So what I had to do was just take some wood, chop it up, try to get to the dry areas, get the fire lighter going. And then I had to just wait for that flame to take it. Then I had to nurture that flame and blow on that flame and look for some dry wood and place that on that flame. And it took a lot of effort. It took a lot of time. It was worth it, by the way. But eventually, that fire became a full-blown fire. And in the same way, we've got to come before God saying, God, I need, as a matter of life and death, this kind of hope. So God, won't you come onto these wet sticks of my heart, these embers that are barely registering any heat, won't you blow upon them? Won't you regrow step by step, living hope in my heart? Here's a verse, by the way, if that's you, that you may want to pray, Romans 15 verses 13, you may want to write this down. May the God of hope, Fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's a verse worth praying every single day for the next week, right? Number four, it's a matter of perseverance. Yes, Lord, I want hope. Tomorrow morning we wake up and walk in some Lego. (laughs) You're like, ah, my hope is dashed again. I'm out. Just like our faith we spoke about last week is the fight of faith. It's worth fighting for. So hope is worth persevering for. Hebrews 10 verses 23, let us hold unswervingly, not a word we use often, a beautiful, powerful word. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. Why? For he who has promised is faithful. And finally, it's a matter of influence. And we know how this works. If you want to become a better runner, yes, you can put your shoes on and run around the block. Yes, you can read a running magazine and you can go onto YouTube. But at some point, if you really want to become a better runner, you are going to surround yourself with runners and you are going to allow yourself to be influenced by good runners. We do this in business. Once again, we can hit the books. But at some point, you're going to surround yourself with peers who are passionate about growing business. And at some point, you're going to have mentors and coaches in your life, and you're going to submit to their influence so that you can grow in business. And in the same way, if we want to grow in hope, it's not, I'm sorry to say, going to happen in front of a TV screen. I'm not condemning anyone online because there's some people sitting here and their bums in this seat, but it's as if they're in front of the TV screen. We need to surround ourselves by a people of hope. We need to submit to their influence. And I know that unfortunately this is not always true, but if ever There ought to be a people of hope on planet earth. It should be the people of the resurrection. And so this is why Christian friendship is so important. This is why being able to talk about what's challenging my hope and what's stealing my hope, won't you pray for me, is so important. This is why those coffees are so important. This is why life groups are so important. 
so that we can have people around us. And just, this is free advertising. Please, if you're not in a life group, if you're not in any form of Christian community, if you're not having Christian friendships in your life, please take a step in that direction. We need the influence and the support and the prayers of the people of hope so that I can grow in turn in hope. And so as I end off 1 Timothy 4 verses 10, Paul says to a young pastor, that is why we labor and strive. Once again, it takes labor, it takes work, it takes striving, it takes perseverance, it takes intentionality. But this is why we do all of that. Because, why? Because we have put our hope in the living God. Let's go back to where we started, the hope scale. For those of you who found yourselves scoring high, I just thank the Lord for you. I thank the Lord for what He's done in your life. But here's a challenge for you. That hope that is registering high is that capital H hope that you've placed in temporary things? Or is that an appropriate, godly, small H hope that you've placed in the good gifts of the giver? I don't want to dash your hope. I want to grow your hope. Because who knows what's going to happen in the next six months? So my challenge to you is, Enjoy the season God has you in. But please, 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 don't place your capital H hope in any of those things. For those of us who scored low on the hope scale, I know many of your stories. And I don't blame you or judge you for one second. But dare you hope again. But this time, let's place our capital H hope in certain things, in ultimate things. And maybe you are praying that prayer, God, there's almost nothing left, but please won't you breathe your breath of your spirits upon me. And so wherever you're at, I'd love to pray for you. So let's pray together. God, you have been described in these verses as the God of hope. If ever there's a person and a place that we can place our trust and our faith and our hope, it is you. But God, you're also the God who entered our difficulties and our challenges. And you overcame them by the cross. You even overcame death by the cross. So we can place our capital H hope in you. But Father, regardless of where we're at, I want to pray for all of us. Romans 15 verses 13. Riverside, those who are with us online, those who are with us here, those who are watching on YouTube at a later stage or listening to the podcast, may the God of hope fill you. May the degree to which you fill fill us be an abundant filling as you give yourself to us. Father, as much as maybe we cannot dare to hope again, fill us, break down those walls that we have established in our hearts so that we may be filled with hope and joy and peace, even a supernatural hope, joy and peace. And maybe it makes no sense when we look at the circumstances that may still prevail. You are growing something powerful within us as we trust you. And God, I pray that you would so fan this into flame that we may overflow with hope. That others may see this in us and be astounded and amazed and know for certain that the only explanation is a supernatural one. So we may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, breathe upon the embers of our hearts. 
fan a comeback hope into flame. As each of us has just felt your voice calling us to take a step in a direction, God, I pray that we'd have the faith and the courage and the conviction during the course of this week to take that step to surround ourselves with people of hope, to trust you. Give us such a focus of you, Jesus, this week. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.